Civics really dictate how your empire is run and what they're good at, so choosing the right ones for your desired empire type is essential for making the most out of your playstyle. But which ones are the very best? Well, let's make a top 10 and find out. But before we get into this, I should probably say that this one is in no particular order. Civics are really good at specific things, so it's hard to rank something for war above or below something for diplomacy, since both can be incredibly powerful or utterly useless depending on your empire and playstyle. Also, we're sticking to government civics for this video since they're used by the largest amount of empires. So if you want videos on Megacorp, Machine and hive mind civics, let me know in the comments. Now that that's all out of the way, let's get into the list. First up, an honourable mention for Philosopher King. This one is a great addition to basically any empire that's working on making the most out of their council positions. You have two boosts to council XP gain, one of which stacks higher, the higher the level of the leader staffing its own position, getting you into a bit of a snowball once it's in use. Getting the highest level councillors is great since basically every position offers more and more bonuses the higher the level of the leader, so maxing out those bonuses as fast as you can really goes a long way to keep you moving forward. Less negative traits for our leaders is also a nice touch to make sure you're getting all that you can out of your leaders, and overall it's great, but if you don't have another civic working alongside it with specific positions to help you, it's only going to take you so far. So first on our list we have Beacon of Liberty. We're going to be starting with a fairly simple one here. The council position is whatever. It's nice to get people on the side of your empire's ethics, but the effects are really the hero of this civic. A 15% bonus to all unity is pretty huge, and it's going to mean far faster traditions, ascension perks, planet ascensions, and more. As well as this, the reduced empire size from pops means affording most of these things will be even easier since you'll be paying less for premium once you get into a much larger empire size with lots of pops in it. You can now feel free to grow your populations as large as you want and still only be paying the same premium of an empire much smaller than you. That unit boost is going to be great right out of the gate and continue to help you out the more the game goes on. And the empire size will only get more value as the game continues. Don't get me wrong, alone these civics aren't going to win you the game, but they'll make one aspect of it far easy to manage and maintain progress and in a game as large as Stellaris, that's enough to make the list. Next we have the Corvée system. This is another option that's basically great for any empire. First of all, no unity penalty for resettlement means you can get unemployed pops working in no time with basically no penalties, add on extra growth from immigration and you should basically never have open jobs for more than a few days before something fills them up. As for the council position, 2% might not seem like a lot, but once you get some levels under that belt, that 2 can quickly become 10 and increase your resource output significantly to all of your base resources. Admittedly, if you're not focusing on planet production for said resources, it might not make a massive difference, but if you build planets with this position in mind, it can really get you a ton of value. The mid-game resource drought often occurs as you start to upgrade buildings and have advanced constructions can be avoided entirely if you have all of these resources coming in and being sold on the galactic market or otherwise utilised. I don't really think I need to go into too much detail about why having tons of resources is a bad thing. More resources means more expansion, cash flow, and generally progress in your empire, so it's never not going to be useful. Since it's only workers, it's going no higher, but it's still a great civic to have in almost any empire. Next up, we have mining guilds. This one is powerful for a similar reason to the last one, but it's obviously focusing on mining. Instead of percentage-based bonuses, it's just a flat increase to every miner's production, meaning if you have a planet focused on mining, the resource income will be crazy since every new worker is a whole extra mineral every single month. Having miners on planets also increases their stability, so plopping a few districts on each each of your planets isn't a bad idea to keep things stable as well as farm a crap load of resources. This one really is dead simple, even more so than the last one. Make tons of minerals, which are used for basically everything like constructions and alloy production, build up planets incredibly quickly, sell any excess on the galactic market for an even stronger economy, and become a billionaire powerhouse in no time. Use that wealth for the betterment of your empire, or buy some dead social media platforms to feed your ego. At that point, the universe is your oyster. As long as the mining industry continues to grow, so will your empire, and stability will reign supreme. Next up we have Catalytic Processing. Now I know you might be wondering why this one is here, and while it may seem like a gimmick, I really think it's a pretty powerful civic to take for honestly most empires. So, in the normal game, minerals are needed for both alloy and general construction, so you have to find a balance between making plenty of alloys and having enough minerals to build up your empire. However, with this civic, minerals can be used entirely for construction, and instead you can use food to fuel your ally production. Now initially, this will probably be a little bit slower, but once you get a few agri worlds on the go, you'll be churning out alloys at an outstanding rate. And if you're worried about turning all your food into alloys and then your people starving, first of all, L, not very capitalist empire review. Secondly, that councillor position will increase food production by 5% per level, get that bad boy staffed of a level 5 leader, and you're looking at a bonus 25% food production. You could be eating 10 meals a day mass producing alloys and still even get close to touching that production. So, the Civic that initially might seem to cripple your food production comes right back around to making it more robust than ever. How about that? Diplomatic Core is next up, moving away from production and towards something a little bit more diplomatic. And hey, it's even in the name, how about that? Making friends is hard, both in real life and Stellaris, but you know what makes it easier? More envoys, diplomatic weight, and a higher trust cap that only gets higher as the game goes on. 
This is more so in game than real life. If you send an envoy to potential friends in real life, they will absolutely avoid you with the water cooler. Anyway, those extra envoys will not only be useful for making friends, but also every other diplomatic task you want them to take part in. That can be first contact, relations manipulation, spy networks, or even the galactic community. They'll make you a powerhouse on the galactic stage without ever having to lift a finger in combat. The extra weight will just make all of those jobs and more far easier, since other empires will be far more willing to bow to your will and votes on galactic resolutions will be taken much more seriously. I mean, it's literally called diplomatic weight. It just makes you better at basically every aspect of the whole diplomacy shtick. Lastly, that stacking trust cap from your account levels will make your allies closer than ever before, willing to follow you into the jaws of hell should you require them to. If you're even remotely interested in partaking in diplomacy, then this civic is almost a must pick. Next we have Pompous Purists. This is another diplomacy based civic, but it has a sassy little twist. The effects here are similar to the diplomatic core, but a little bit shuffled around. You still have the extra two envoys, but now say flat increase to trust growth. Yes, we're losing the higher cap, but quicker growth will get others to the max friends that you can be a lot faster. So while the heights may not be as high, you'll reach them a lot faster. The flat weight increase is instead stacking based on your counselor. So over time, you'll be more and more influential on the galactic stage. But the main focus of this, and I suppose the trade-off, if you could call it that, is the fact that you can only engage others in diplomacy rather than be engaged with. Now, I say this is a trade-off because you won't know if others want deals unless you ask them first, so you could miss out on some goodness if you aren't constantly checking. But if you want to be in total control of your own diplomacy, it's hardly a downside since you can make deals and friendships with whoever you want without having to worry about idiotic deals from other empires that are wasting your time and you're never going to accept them in a million years. If you're newer to the game, it's probably best to avoid this one to begin with since you need to be super on top of your diplomacy game, but if you can handle it, you can be a powerhouse of the diplomatic arts in no time. Next up, we have functional architecture. Back to planetary focus with this one, and it's a great pairing for the mining guilds if you're super into speedy planet building. The extra building slots will let you make the most of your planet right from the get-go without the need for extra districts to increase your capacity. The reduced planet building cost will let you get your planets filled up for that much cheaper, and the increased build speed from your counselor will get them filled up that much faster. Combine all of this and you can get planets from nothing to bustling metropolises in no time flat. Now granted, there's nothing here to increase pop growth, so all you'll really be doing is laying the groundwork for a full planet, but still, having them totally built up and waiting for pops isn't necessarily a bad thing if you can afford it, and with all of these bonuses, you should be able to no problem. Even better if you can get some immigration on the go to ship in pops from other planets and empires for speedy growth, but well, that's up to you and your playstyle. It may eventually outlive its usefulness in the later game, but you should reach that point a lot faster than normal, so that's just fine by me to get yourself a tasty lead pretty much right out the gate. Next we have Ascensionist, sticking with the planet focus and tossing in a hint of Unity with this one. Planetary Ascension is one of those features that you probably forget about more than you use it, but if you pay enough attention and have the Unity to spare, it can make all of your planets far more productive no matter what their specialization is. If you're not familiar with what Planet Ascension is, then let me give you the spark notes. This little arrow button on the planet designation can be clicked to ascend planets at the cost of unity. Doing this will reduce the amount of empire size the planet creates and increase the power of your chosen designation, essentially making the planet even better at its specialization. The bottom line is more productive planets by a big percentage jump, whilst also reducing the cost of traditions, research and more by bringing down empire size. What's not to love? Increasing these effects by 25%, making them even more powerful is cash. Reducing the cost of doing it is cash. Cheaper traditions is never a bad thing, so more cash and getting more monthly unit with a stacking percentage is a big old stack of cash. This is such a sleeper civic since it seems really specific and it is, but if you can fit it in your empire and focus on ascending your planets, you can get some pretty insane results, especially in smaller and taller empires. Coming next to nationalistic zeal, I'm gonna be closing out with some more with these last two. And between the two of them, it's really hard to pick a favorite. First, nationalistic zeal, it's top tier. For any empire want to do planet warring, especially if it's for territory. Cheaper claims means you can make more of them, which means you can take more territory at once during wartime. Less exhaustion just means you'll be a lot harder to wear down, and even if the war is equal, you'll still be raring for more whilst your enemy will be ready to admit defeat. And lastly, that naval capacity. Yes, I know that 1% seems like it sucks, but it stacks, and with research, you can have over 200 capacity by the mid game, no problem. Just get some levels on your leader's belt, and you can get a few more ships, and sometimes that's all you need to make the difference. It's one of those that only gets better the more you focus on the thing it's increasing. So rush naval capacity with tech and buildings to see more and more value out of this one. Now yeah, it sounds like you really need to specialise to get any value out of this civic, but if you're playing a war-focused empire, you'll want to build this way anyway, so you might as well make the most of it. And lastly, we come to Crusader Spirit, closing out with another war civic, and this one is a tasty one. Elephant in the room first, yes, you do get locked into the Liberation Wars policy, but my brothers, sisters, and non-binary hipsters, the gains. First of all, flat weapon damage and build cost reduction. Seems like small upgrades, but you gotta remember that these go on every single ship you build. So 5% damage output boost for every single ship in your fleet, pretty spicy bonus. Then we have the counselor positions and it just keeps getting better. Extra ship fire rate and yeah, 1% but get some levels, quickly gains five and again on every single ship. So that 5% damage increase adds onto the 5% fire rate for big damage. Then we also get extra army damage. So if your Giga Chad fleets aren't enough, you can bring in some armies to clean up any planets that remain. 
Now, yes, this Civic, it does railroad you a little bit with the war policy, but the bonuses it brings make religion worth it. If you want to break from the standard invasion wars and want to instead bring the word of our Lord to the Xenos of the cosmos, look no further than the spirits of the Crusaders. That's my list. Did I miss any that you thought should have made it? Leave them in the comments down below. Like, subscribe, and if you want more Solaris content, then why not check out this video going over the top 10 noob mistakes to avoid.